All righty. Well, hey, hey, guys. I'm Fancy. And I'm Colleen. And this is Murder by Design. And tonight we have with us two very, very special guests. And I'm sorry if you have any hope, trouble hearing Cheryl. We had to have her call in instead of be on live with us on the uh, on the screen. So hopefully you guys are able to hear her tonight. But we've got Cheryl Mack McCollum and Stephen David Lampley tonight. And we have like insane breaking news and then more breaking news and then, you know, kind of breaking news. <laughs> So tonight we're going to be talking with them about how they helped Atlanta PD um, catch a serial killer in less than a week. So Cheryl, you want to tell us how this came out? Because I know you were one of the first people that announced it and caught that the mayor had kind of dropped this information. Well, yeah. I mean, I was listening to the press conference like everybody else, and I had already seen where Two homeless people had been murdered, mm -hmm. and she announced a third victim and said that, you know, two of them had already been connected, and they believed that the third one would be, and she just glossed right over it and went right into police use of force, and I guess <laughs> it kind of stunned me that there wasn't more from her mm -hmm. about that, and so I tweeted and just put on my Facebook page, did the mayor seriously just say Atlanta had a serial killer because as the country probably knows, uh, we've been a little busy Yeah, yeah. in the last couple of weeks with a whole lot of stuff going on. So, you know, not just COVID-19 and quarantine and protesting and marches and riots, but we've had a lot going on with our law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've had eight police officers arrested yeah. and it's been very public and, and, Love, and then of course we had the chief of police resign. Mm -hmm. So in the yeah. midst of all of that, I just thought, you know, we've got blue flu happening. We've got a lot of things going on potentially, and I just thought I'm going to try to help if I can. And quite honestly, fancy, I know I I knew probably five people off the top of my head to call <laughs> to make sure that we were going to be on the right track. Mm -hmm. and that we can actually give them something that they could use. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I saw it within minutes and I was like, "What? Oh my goodness, cuz I, you know, I wasn't watching the press conference. I don't live in Atlanta, so I hadn't really paid attention. I knew things were going on, you know. We know, uh, and we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff a little bit later in the in the broadcast, but yeah, I saw it and I was like, "Oh my god, Colleen, Colleen, Colleen." <laughs> you know, it was like there's a serial killer. There's a ser Cheryl says there's a serial killer. <laughs> If June so, couldn't get any more screwed yeah. up. <laughs> so what was your first thoughts, Cheryl, you know, and, and who did you reach out to right away? And, and how did you start working on this? Well, again, if, if anybody saw my very first post about it, there were things about the case from June 1st to today, really, mm -hmm. that was strikingly familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So I was, I knew if this was that familiar to me, then I had heard a case very similar. So I just went back in my memory, and sure enough, in 2014, you know, we had a case in Atlanta extraordinarily, horrifically similar, mm -hmm. where, you know, one person was shooting homeless people while they were asleep. Oh, wow. And two were on the sidewalk, one was under an underpass, um, they were wrapped in blankets. So again, you're you're talking about somebody with nothing to steal. They're no threat to you whatsoever because they're sound asleep. Mm -hmm. They don't have a door they could even lock to protect themselves from you. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about some of the most vulnerable people that we have that are mm -hmm. adults, right? Right. So I, my first reaction was this has got to be a copycat. And I knew in 2014 that David Quinn worked the case, so I even tagged him in my post. And he was like, oh, my God, Carol, yeah. Like, he recognized it immediately. It was his case. And I knew that in 2014, there were two men and a female. Uh, again, they were sleeping. They were, you know, homeless at the time. Right. They put no threat, and he used a forty-five caliber. So... Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I was pretty open that I would state my reputation that this killer would use a forty-five caliber. But wow. here's the thing. It is easy to get tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that's really important, and people listening to me will understand, this is horrific and this is horrible and these are human beings, but there's another side to us where we almost go on autopilot yeah. and we start putting these puzzle pieces together in our head and we detach a little bit because we have to. Sure. Um, I want to sit and get teary-eyed and cry and all that. I don't have time right now. So I want to be sure, am I making this a copycat? Because let's face it, a serial killer for us, that's the dance floor, baby. And if you've got a serial killer that is a copycat, that's sexy all day. (laughs) (laughs) I want to be sure that that side of me Mm -hmm. was not writing this Harlequin romance that wasn't accurate, even though, again, the similarities to anyone should be striking. So I called out with some people that not only did I adore, but I trust their judgment. They're going to tell me the truth. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to give anybody information that's not going to help and not going to be accurate because, you know, that's doing a disservice. So right. one of the first people that I called was Stephen David Lampley. Right. And, and listen, I did that for a couple of reasons. I want people to know this now. This man has had a career. He's retired. He has started a second and a third and a fourth career. <laughs> he, this is how he makes money. Mm-hmm. And I want to be clear. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Right. You've got enough expertise. You can do something that only a few people in the country can do. You should be paid. Mm-hmm. Every mm-hmm. single time I call him, not only does he call me back, he don't ask for nothing. Ever. That's right. So he knows that the Institute is a nonprofit. And so when I called him, mm-hmm. he immediately jumped in and started to help. So I'm going to let you turn it over to him right now so he can talk a little bit about that. But he got involved Wednesday morning at about 7 o'clock, mm-hmm. and it was on at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and it's only Friday. <laughs> right, it's only Friday. So, Stephen, she gets you up at, at the at the butt crack of dawn. <laughs> no, and you she know, gets you involved in this. I, I'm a 24-7 kind of guy. I, I sleep in shifts when I can. N- not unlike working as a police officer on the street. So right. yeah, I actually had, uh, Cheryl doesn't know this, I had been to sleep for like two and a half hours. <laughs> but <you> know, <laughs> Because I, I, I spend my mornings uh, a lot of time writing because it's quiet. Uh, there's mm-hmm. nobody knocking at my door. So uh, I spend my morning hours when everybody else is asleep writing. But but listen, Cheryl, you call me anytime, and you know that. I, I don't care if I've been up all night. I'm I'm always available to help you in any way whatsoever. So you get involved in this and what what it, what she co- makes this call to you and what goes through your mind and where do you start? Well, I had seen the and you have to understand, I get a lot of people will contact me and say, hey, tell me, tell me what you think of this. Well, I don't know because I don't I really don't have time to watch every case that, that's out there. Um, right. So when I had seen the headlines on this and I had seen the post that she talked about where she mentioned, did the mayor just make reference about a serial killer and then just sort of like ignore it? I saw that. Uh, but I didn't know a lot about the case. I knew the headlines. I knew the circumstances uh, because the headlines were very blunt about what happened uh, right. in that situation. Uh, but uh, she, she asked me, uh, she, the question she asked me, she says, who do we need to be looking for? And mm-hmm. again, I didn't, I, I didn't really have a lot of information. So she sent me some information and I went digging and it was pretty apparent, uh, at least at the, at the, at the beginning scale that we had probably a copycat and we had probably mm-hmm. a mission, a mission oriented type killer. Uh, now what is it as far through is what, what is a mission type killer? Just so a so mission type killer sure. is someone who kills a certain group or class of people uh and their thinking is by doing so they're making the world a better place and a lot of times we find this that mission type killers will kill prostitutes okay uh, they, they, they think that by doing so they, they're on this mission to rid the world of this group of people and we're going mm-hmm. to make society a better place because of it mm-hmm mm-hmm so you decide that the, you think that this is what you've got going on. So what else do you tell Cheryl so that she has something to go back to APD with? 
Well, when you have this type of, of killer, and he, he appeared to be an organized killer somewhat, but then disorganized as well because of some of the things he did. And, and you'll find that we don't always have a serial killer that is 100% organized or 100% disorganized. You'll find that they have one or two traits or more of each. Uh, mm -hmm. But this individual would have been someone that was, like I told Cheryl, would have been in their late 20s, early 30s, maybe around, maybe as, as, as old as 35. Uh, and that by the young. fact that, the, I'm sorry. That seems young. Well, a lot of times serial killers are a lot younger than that, especially disorganized oh, yeah. serial killers can be like in their early 20s. Uh, so when you have an organized serial killer, you have a professional type as well, a professional type of individual. Now, it's my understanding that this individual was unemployed at the time, uh, mm -hmm. but, but we're looking at a, a certain type. We're looking at a, a usually a typically older individual. Uh, so that, that's pretty much, that's all I had to go on at that time because I did mm -hmm. not have access to, to the police reports. I didn't have crime scene photos to look at. So that, that, sure. was, that was the initial, initially what I told her. Mm -hmm. And so then how does this come down, guys? So, so Stephen gives you this idea, Cheryl, and how, where do you go from there? You guys start working together to figure out or how, how, did, it, how did it unfold? Well, at that point, I'm, I have other people that I'm moving to Mm -hmm. Because the thing, if if Stephen gives me a playbook, mm -hmm. and then somebody else says, "Yep, page four is right," and somebody else says, "Yep, page two is solid," then I know we're on to something. So mm -hmm. I went from there to Dr. Laura Petler, who y'all know is the yep. criminologist with the Dr. Oz show and all that. Mm -hmm. So I said, "Yeah, you know, you look at these three scenes, and then for me, one overlap them with the three scenes from the case of 2014." Mm -hmm. um, the perpetrator in 2014 was schizophrenic. Does this have any, you know, signs that he might be suffering from mental illness? Mm -hmm. um, she said she would, of course, need to see more of the crime scene photographs, which we didn't have at the time. Um, but, you know, certainly think there's, you know, a possibility that he went undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And then I went from there to Dr. Dwayne Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a weapons expert. Oh, and he's okay. like, when you get somebody shot five times, then that's going to change, you know, which weapon they're using. I mean, some, you know, handguns are only going to have a capacity to fire five or six times. So is he reloading or does he have a weapon that has the capacity to shoot more than that? So, mm -hmm. and that's one of those things, food for thought. Then I talked to Christine Menina, who you know is a detective about in Indianapolis, a homicide, mm -hmm. who had the highest solve rate in the United States for a long time. So right. I figured I might know something. So she's, she's always real good to, you know, do the overall with me. So mm -hmm. not just the scene, but the type of location he selected. So again, of all the homeless people sleeping all over Atlanta, whether it's in a park, or a front, you know, face of a church or a building. He selected people that were on the sidewalk and in a tent, and he did that on purpose mm -hmm. because he was walking. He was simply walking around, selected his person, and kept moving. There was no mm -hmm. car involved, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then the last person that I spoke to was Douglas McGregor, who's a geographical profiler. Mm -hmm. And I sent him very little. I sent him information on 2014 and I sent him information today and he and Steven their information lined up that mm -hmm. this was a person that lived north of Atlanta he didn't live in the city and that he used public transportation and Douglas thought that the first murder was his anchor and he was working from there mm -hmm. and so that's what I gave to APD and they had mm -hmm. everything that we had by Thursday, and then ironically, I get a tip from a confidential informant who says, here's your guy, here's his photograph. And right, I immediately, yeah. this morning, sent that to APD, um, and Sergeant Layton takes me back, or not takes me, I texted him the information. He called me right back and said, he's in custody right now. And that's David Lee, right? Correct. Now, is he? Now, are you guys saying he's responsible for both 2014 and now, or is this a no, copycat no, of, no, of 2014? Not at all. Okay. What I'm saying is, I thought it was a copycat sure. of 2014. Okay. 
and now the interesting thing about David Lee is that he actually works or or has volunteered for a for a hands on ATL, which works with the homeless people, correct? And that's the photograph that I sent out because that's the photograph that was sent to me, and th that leads off the page for me. You can imagine, right? And right. Atlanta is an extraordinary organization that deals with feeding people, working with the homeless population, working with people that have health issues. Mm -hmm. They do so much good mm -hmm. that it's just horrifying that he may be connected to them in any way. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Again, you know, Ted Bundy volunteered at the Rape Crisis Center. I mean, sometimes right. people do that. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what his motivation would have been, but I, I want to say again, Atlanta Police Department, with everything that they had going on, and I really want people to understand, there has been no other time in history like this one. Right. None of us have dealt with a pandemic. Sure. And all that ball and then mm -hmm. on top of that to have your chief resign and co-workers arrested and mm -hmm. people throwing things at you and mm -hmm. firecrackers going off and things being set on fire right. it's really an unusual time and what those officers did and those detectives did in a short period of time is nothing less than extraordinary Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. A, less than a week to identify that there is a serial killer, that you get a profile, and you figure out who they are and arrest them. Um, that's un unprecedented. <laughs> I mean, that's unprecedented. And then on top of that, like you're saying, you guys are dealing with a lot down there. And we did talk with, you know, you guys a couple, you know, a week or two ago um, when all of the, you know, all of the things started breaking out from dealing with the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery um, situations, mm -hmm. you know, and you guys were, you know, you guys were so kind to come on and talk with us and explain to us some of those different things that uh, Stephen talked with us about, um, you know, what the riots are what's different between riots and, and protesters and what, you know, you can expect from a riot team because he did many years mm -hmm. on a riot team, you know, and you talked with us about how nobody ever, you know, there's no police officer ever, ever who is trained to do what uh, Chauvin did, you know, with, with George Floyd and, and how outraged you were, you know, and, and both of you were, I mean, all, mm -hmm. everyone we've talked with have been so outraged about that, but now you guys have been hit pretty hard there in Atlanta. Um, like you said, eight officers have been arrested. Um, I know that last week, this kind of goes into their arrest of Officer um, Officer Rolf um, in the Rayshard uh, Brooks case. But last week, uh, two officers were arrested based on the fact that they, uh, they tried to make a, a stop during a riot. Um, and they pulled two, you know, uh, two kids out of the car, not kids, but two young men out of the car and used tasers. And so they were arrested for using excessive force with those tasers. Correct. Is that, is that what happened? Correct. It was a male and female, right? Mm -hmm. It was a student from Morehouse and a student from Spelman. Okay. And so at that time, the, was it the DA that said that that was excessive force with the deadly weapon at that time that he considered this taser to be? Is that who it was? Correct. Right. Correct. So then a week later, we have this situation with Rayshard Brooks. We've all seen um, pieces of this video, right? So Stephen, you've seen the video, correct? With the with this, with the I have not seen Rayshard all Brooks? of the video. No, I have not. I've not seen all but, of it. No. But you've seen parts of it. Yes, the parts I have. that you've seen. Did you see anything unusual during this this the situation with what the well, police were doing? Anything? I. Again, without seeing the whole video, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to pass judgment on pieces. Right. Uh, right. Uh, on, on, I do understand that there were some accusations made of the one of the officers, Officer Rolf, I believe, the mm -hmm. actions that he did that apparently, based on what I'm told, is not based on video. So, again, mm -hmm. I don't want to pass judgment on, on pieces or parts that I've seen without seeing sure. all of it. Sure. Right. Sure. But now we were seeing, you know, what we've seen so far was was they did try to de-escalate this situation with him for quite some time, yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I guess there's some sort of scuffle that happens. A taser is pulled out and shot back, and then the the 
the officer shoots. Now you said before when we were talking about the riots about the certain level of you know a, a, a force. You know, like right. you don't meet force with force; you meet force with the next thing. So, right. in that being, you know, I'm not talking about anything else, but just yeah. with that piece, knowing sure. that he took, turned around, shot at Taser, was that the was that the appropriate next level for the cop for for Officer Ralph to you know then fire at that point? It could be. It could be now, could depending be. on depending on what a department's weapons, uh, what they allow to be used. Mm -hmm. For instance, before sure. tasers, we didn't have that. We didn't have that wrong. So it depends mm -hmm. on what the what tools that they were allowed to use. But typically, mm -hmm. if somebody has a taser, that would that could very well be the next level. Is it's a firearm, lethal force. And what is the what is the problem with him having that taser? What could have happened from him having that that would make the cops feel, you know, that they were that this next force was needed? You know, uh, well, for, first of what all, could have happened it, at that point? Just having it is like someone having having a gun. And I've been in a situation several times where somebody mm -hmm. would have a gun or, or a weapon, uh, taser, whatever you mm -hmm. it, again, it, you can't put every situation into a basket and say, this is right. how it is. So you have to take literally each case as it happens at a time. Uh, and the situations that I was always in, while they might have a gun, they never pointed it at me. Had they mm -hmm. pointed it at me, then that would be a, you know, all, sorry, all bets are off at that point. Yep. I feel sure. like my life's in danger and I'm going to shoot you. That's the way that is. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, all the situations I've been in where they had a weapon, be it a knife, a gun, rifle, AK-47 one time, uh, oh it was never a position to where I was immediately threatened with my life. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. didn't shoot. Now, by the mere fact that he had the taser, that mm -hmm. to me is a no-shoot situation. But if you raise the taser up and mm -hmm. especially fire it, we've got a totally different ballgame. Right, because right. we've talked before that it's once force is used, then it's you you have to raise it above. Because if they shoot you with a taser, and I mean, people can suffer heart attacks. You yeah. know, it's electricity. It sure. can kill, it can kill you, especially you know we don't know their medical history. Right, so that right. Could, it's a scary and potentially life threatening situation for the officers involved. And sure. so this is definitely a different scenario than what we've seen in other recent cases mm -hmm. that um, there was force actually used against the officer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we talked she, just, yeah, Cheryl. Right. So Cheryl, I know we talked a little bit about this the other night when we couldn't get our technology going. Um, so, in, in this situation, how, why is it that, so so is a taser in Atlanta generally labeled as a deadly weapon? That's first. Let's, let's, let's go with that. Absolutely not. It's less than lethal. That's why law enforcement uses it as mm -hmm. the next level. So why do you think the DA thought, d decided to come out and say that with the first two officers using it on, you know, um, rioters, and now he's changing it to, to a different to a different scenario when it's somebody firing, you know, taking this weapon from a from an officer and firing it on an officer. So doesn't see it, that seem a little wishy washy there? I think you just answered it. <laughs> <laughs> it appears that he is changing what something is to fit a scenario that he's pushing. So a so, narrative that he's that he's trying to get there, right? And so. Yeah. Um, has the DA ever been like this before with, with a kind of harsh on police in Atlanta, or is this something new that you're seeing? I think if you were to poll the majority of police officers in Fulton County, mm -hmm. they must say that he is not a huge fan. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Which that's odd. Yeah. I mean, he works with them, right? So you would think that he would be, be, you know, have a have a good relationship with the officers, yeah? The other piece that needs to be pointed out is mm -hmm. he has run unopposed for 20 years. And this year, mm -hmm. he's in a runoff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have the theory now that he's pushing this mm -hmm. because it's free publicity and he's mm -hmm. given in to the people that are, you know, the most angry, the most vocal. Right. And that is, of course, people that are, you know, against law enforcement right now. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we've listen, seen. I can't, I can't speak to what's in his heart. I mean, I know him. Mm-hmm. I've known him for 30 years. Mm-hmm. And there's some things that I would like to see. I would like to see due process. I would mm-hmm. like to see the GBI finish their investigation. I would like to see a DA that just simply comes out and says these are the charges when it's appropriate and he's got all the information. When Mm -hmm. you say in a press conference, I have all the preliminary results. Mm -hmm. Preliminary means you ain't done. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So for you to charge somebody with 11 counts of the preliminary information, to me, is unethical. Including it up to the death penalty, you know, first degree murder that would carry a death penalty charge for this officer, right? It seems like all he would need to do is come out and say, we are waiting for the GBI to finish. As soon as they are finished, if charges are appropriate, the officers will be charged. But he gives a press conference where he has demonstrative evidence. He, and he's adding things that nobody knew before. Sure. And the right. critical piece, at the end, the last thing he does is put up this photograph and says that Officer Ross kicked Mr. Brooks while he lay in the street dying. Now, Stacey, I'm going to tell you something. If that is true, mm-hmm. everybody in the country needs to see it so that just like with Mr. Foley, we can be on the same page and say this will not happen. Right. This is not the way law enforcement operates. This is not the way we're going to act as a country. He did not show that to us. Right. Nobody has seen that. Right. There's so- a photograph that looks like the officer is like, almost going to kick a soccer ball. But you don't see a photograph where he actually makes contact with Mr. Brooks. Right now, right. I, like, and and that and that's a very it's a very blurry picture. You can barely make out that it's even human beings. Like, it, it's terribly, right. terribly horrible quality. Now, I have seen a, a, a some clips and some different pieces. I think before the the police might have collected up, um, you know, people that were posting their own, you know, videos that they had made. And to me, what it looks like is an officer stepping on his arm and kicking away the weapon that he has in his hand. Now that is normal protocol, right? If he's still, even though you've shot him, if he had a weapon, the first thing you guys would do would be to approach and get rid of the weapon, correct? And then get down and check for for vitals and things, correct, Stephen? Both of you have been in the, both of you have been in the field. So that's what you would do, right? Yes, just because he fired the weapon doesn't mean he doesn't have access to fire maybe again or or use it in some way. Yeah, by all means, de-arm the person, sure. 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 Well, and so like when we talked about uh, like the George Floyd case, like that's why they waited to charge the officers in that case until they had all of the information, all the evidence. They wanted to have that strong case and, you know, they can't backpedal it. And it seems like this day DA has made a very poor decision in not having the full information yet. Like you said, preliminary results. And now has made these charges. And if those charges don't stick, if they're or all of them don't stick at the same time, there's going to be issues in the case itself. And so I think that snap judgment, rush judgment, not the most intelligent uh, choice by um, our prosecutor here. Yeah. So what do you think? Why would he not wait for the GBI to finish the investigation? Is it just because it doesn't fit the narrative that he's trying to capitalize on right now? Or do you think there's something else there, guys? I think Cheryl's right. We have an election year. Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. That's my opinion. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen him rush to this judgment before, Cheryl? Not like this. Not like this. And so this has caused a a ripple effect now, you know, I know we have been seeing, you know, police officers in other cities walking off um, saying, we're not going to do this anymore because, you know, we're, we're doing what we're told to do. This happened up in, and we talked about this, Stephen, when we did the riot thing, you know, this happened up in, in New York when uh, the man was, you know, pushed and 57 of the officers walked off the riot team um, in solidarity. What they were saying was solidarity with their two officers that were, you know, then, you know, arrested and, and put through the ringer on that. But in, in the same sense, they were walking off because they felt that they, 
they couldn't do their jobs anymore, you know, because if we're going to be arrested for doing what we're told to do, how are we supposed to effectively do what we're supposed to do? So we're seeing this create a ripple effect across the country. Um, but mostly now in, in Atlanta, Cheryl, and you want to tell us a little bit what, about what's going on down there with it, with the climate and what's happening with these officers right now? Well, I mean, I can just tell you what I'm sure y'all already know. You're mm -hmm. talking about a group of people that have been sit on and had things thrown at them mm -hmm. and told to stand down, don't do anything, had patrol cars burned, had businesses mm -hmm. and museums and hotels and restaurants damaged, um, CNN was damaged, mm -hmm. and, you know, then when something does occur where they have to engage. They don't have an option. They don't believe. Mm -hmm. Then they're arrested. Yeah. And if you look at Mr. Brooks's scene, again, the officers were extremely polite. Mm -hmm. They spoke with him for 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. At no time were they rough with him, rude with him, mm -hmm. or presented any type of threat to him. It was not until he changed that scene that they used force to try to take him under arrest and handcuffs. Sure. Then we fought them off and took the taser. At that point, he's a felon. Right. And he's, he's already, I mean, he's already, he was already in, in big trouble because he was, he's not just a drunk driver. Like that, that was part of this, but he's already out on parole on, and right. only released because of the situation with COVID-19. And, and, and I stated this when they first started talking about releasing prisoners early due to the COVID-19. And I understood where they were coming from of trying to keep this, you know, mitigated within the, the prison systems. But I, I really knew that there was going to start to be some sort of backlash from that. And we've seen several of them come out that were paroled um, early because of this that have gone on to reoffend almost immediately, uh, Mr. Brooks being one, you know, and so he's out on this parole, by, uh, parole, which is automatically, you know, he's driving drunk, that's a parole violation. So now he's in a situation, right, where it's not just going to the drunk tank for the night, he's facing going back to prison, right? Possibly. But, right. So this is what I'm saying, take that completely out of it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Right. The minute he took that taser, mm -hmm. he took the entire focus of what they were doing. Right. And even then, they tried to go one level above. He's fighting them. He punched the officer in the face. Mm -hmm. When he got control of the taser, mm -hmm. he hit Officer Brunson in the head with it. He fell back, hit his head on the concrete, got a concussion. When he runs off, he is now a fleeing felon. Right. So that's very different than somebody run away because they had too much strength. Sure. So the last thing these officers want is for him to take that taser, get away, incapacitate a female, rape her, mm -hmm. incapacitate a store owner, rob them. Mm -hmm. If he were to use that weapon on any civilian anywhere, mm -hmm. I mean, that would have just been horrid. Sure. So yeah. they have to stop the threat of that happening. Right. When he turned and fired at that officer, you can even see Officer Ross fall into that red car. Mm -hmm. He believes he had been shot. Right. So, again, it is textbook. They started very calm, put your hands behind your back. When he fought, they fought. When he wouldn't stop, they went to the taser. When the taser didn't work and they were fired upon, they went one level above. Mm -hmm. That is SOP. That is Sure. Level of, you know, threat assessment 101. I mean, I don't know what else to tell you. Right, before. right. Out of the table. So, Stephen, um, some people have asked, um, and I, and I've, and I've, you know, it's a good question, but why um, would they not have just let him? You know, they have his driver's license, they have his car, they have all this. Why not just let him go and pick him up later? Um, I've let's had that talk. question. I let's think go. it's an ignorant question, but <laughs> well, let's go back you know, to what I, Cheryl. I, I let's let's, let's, Georgia, if yeah. mm -hmm. let's go back to what Cheryl said. Yeah. You you mm -hmm. can't allow him to leave DUI. He is a sure. weapon waiting to happen behind mm -hmm. the wheel of a car who says he can't 
not only can he possibly kill someone else, he's a danger to himself as well. So you sure. he not only you can't allow you cannot allow a person who is intoxicated, uh, whether it's by alcohol, pills, or sniffing, to leave uh, and and get them later. Right. Well, I mean, into in my mind, like. Getting them later, I mean, that causes a whole nother wealth of problems that that you don't know what you're walking into at that point. You don't know if he's got weapons somewhere or who he's going to go to or what he's going to do or if he's even going to go back home. You know, now he knows that he's in big trouble. He's fleed. You know, he could go anywhere. Right. So to me, I don't think in the history of ever have we just let. A, oh, well, you know what? He's all right. We'll just we'll just let him go and pick him up later. I've never heard that. I this, that he, For even it to be suggested is just seems so so crazy to me. Well, like you know? said, um, the taser is a weapon. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, well and, 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 and just having him, you know, you take out his prior history of anything. If he mm -hmm. was, you know, and mm -hmm. like just an 18 year old fresh out of high school as, you know, no record, no nothing. You know, you have somebody who's intoxicated and just behind the wheel, you try to, you know, arrest them for a DUI. And if they take your weapon, they fire your weapon at you. That is the crime. Even if he right. wasn't drunk, you took somebody, you took an officer's weapon, even if he was sober, took an officer's weapon, fired it at the officer. That is a crime. Right, right. And, and, they, and you know, when he turned and he fired, you know, there's no, no telling as he's running what what other thing he could have pulled out. The officers don't know at that point. All they know is that they've been fired upon. Like you said, um, Officer Rolf fell backwards into the car as, you know, almost like, oh my God, I've been hit, you know, um, not real. And, and, and a taser, when it hits you, you know, it kind of, it, it shocks your whole body, you know, it, it plays with your mind. It does all kinds of different things. So who knows what they felt at that moment. And the other officer, he has no idea. Did he grab a gun? Did he get the taser? Whatever happened, you know, because it's happening in such a, a quick moment. So now the fallout from this is that uh, you're, you you mentioned it earlier, Cheryl, and I'd like you to explain it. We're, we're seeing something called what you called the blue flu. So okay. what what is the blue flu? All right. It's when officers in mass call out sick. So mm -hmm. they're not going to abandon posts. They're not going to quit their job. They're not walking out to never return. Mm -hmm. They're just not coming that night. But, right. but I, I can't hear Stephen. So I hope I'm not overlapping and repeating something he said. But I want to mm -hmm. answer one thing in case he didn't. Mm -hmm. In the state of Georgia, DUI is an arrestable offense. The officer has no discretion there. You must arrest for DUI. Okay. And the way it came about is back in the day, we used to drive people home. Mm -hmm. And we would let them call somebody to come get them. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Once they got home, they would drink a little more. They would laugh because they didn't get in any trouble. And they would take another car and go back out again. Right. And then if they arrested or killed somebody, mm -hmm. then we would get in trouble because we had them. Why yeah. would you put him back out on the street? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So all of these things have come about because people demanded it. Just like when people say, well, I don't know why the officer couldn't have just shot him in the leg. Because they're not mm -hmm. trained to do that. They and already used the hands. Their mm -hmm. hands didn't work. Mm -hmm. They tried to use the taser. The taser didn't work. Mm -hmm. He had to stop that threat. Right. Period. Right. I mean, because you can shoot them on the leg, they can keep running. I mean, it, it, truthfully, because if you're not shooting, you know, to, but, to, see, to... They're not even trained to do that. Right. And most people in your listening audience, if they ever got a gun, if, if their father or grandfather mm -hmm. or mother, somebody gave them a gun to use, mm -hmm. I guarantee you 90% of the people in your audience were told, if you ever pull this out, use it. Shoot and if kill. you're going to... Use it, use it to kill. That's right. In other words, you're playing for the shoulder. You're not with the shoulder anyhow, sugar. Everybody's running and moving. Mm -hmm. it, it's hard to make contact. Oh, right. I mean, some officers don't do well with a target that ain't moving. So, right. you know, you're moving and the suspect is moving. Mm -hmm. but this, this, is not, this is not wonderful stuff. This isn't pretty. You're talking about the loss of life. Yeah. And nobody right. is happy here. Right. Nobody is celebrating that anybody was killed. Sure. I mean, this is horrible. This is horrible for the officer. Mm -hmm. It's horrible for the department. Mm -hmm. Clearly for his family. This is life altering for all of them. Mm -hmm. And awful. Mm -hmm. All of them. Mm -hmm. But it's 
not necessarily illegal. Now, here's what we're going to do, and I want everybody to understand. If anybody was old enough to watch the um, Rodney King trial. Yeah, I was. The same thing is going to happen in Atlanta. Yeah. We are going to frame by frame, second by second, who did what and when, and then why. Then right. who did what and when and why. Right. And, and that's one of the times that we saw saw a similar, you know, a, a very similar climate, but it didn't last as long as this one had of, you know, that with that ended up with uh, Reginald Derry, you know, being pulled out of his his truck and beaten, you know, and, and I watched all that. I was I was. God, what year was that? I think I was in high school or or very close to high school at the point in point in time that 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 all went down. Um, and I was in California at the time. I remember it very well, you know, Um and so I think I, this, this kind of thing takes time. This yeah. is not something you're going to have a result in in a week. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have four or five experts argue about what you're saying. Yeah. And then you've got to test the officer statement. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, witness statements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their body cam, cross check that with everybody's cell phone that got something at a different angle. Sure. This mm -hmm. is not something you can charge somebody with in a week. There's no way. So do you think that that's going to uh, impact how this in ultimately ends up? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's, if, and here's the sad thing. If any of those 11 charges are dropped, then mm -hmm. people are going to be upset again because it's a conspiracy. If charges are added to, then people are going to be upset because it's a conspiracy. If, there's your, you have now put us in a no-win situation mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. waiting in showing all the evidence when it's time and explaining what the evidence is and then say, did he act appropriately when they were fighting? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did he act appropriate trying to employ the taser? Yes. Did he act appropriately when he shot Mr. Brooks? If no, then address that. Mm -hmm. If yes, then address that. But this is what I'm saying. We've got to calm down and wait for facts. Sure. From somebody who doesn't have, you know, a whole lot of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to come from HD. It doesn't need to come from Paul Howard, who admits that his, you know, part of his staff, investigators or the physical district attorneys were on scene at Wendy's by 1.30 in the morning. Right. To do what? I yeah. mean, if, if that's an active crime scene, they don't need to be inside that yellow tank. That's not their job. Right, right. Their job is to get <sighs> evidence and reports that the police give them. So if they're already on scene and they've already drawn these conclusions and they've talked to witnesses independently, but then Atlanta calls in the GBI, are we fighting ourselves now? I mean, this is not mm -hmm. this is not a good look. It's just not. All right, I understand. And so now, because of this, you know, we've had several districts that have had complete complete walkouts, you know, um, uh, and, and we're, are you seeing a fallout from that? Cheryl? I mean, I don't understand fallout. And here's what's going on. You've got some people that are hurt. Yeah. And you've got some people that feel like if I go to work and have mm -hmm. to defend my life, mm -hmm. I'm going to go to prison because that's been made very, very clear to me. If I use my taser, I'm going to prison. If I pull somebody out of a car, I'm going to prison. If I shoot somebody, I'm going to prison. Well, it's going to be difficult to police if you can't use force. Because yes, no, please, and thank you is not going to get it done. Mm -hmm. And so Atlanta has already done some things before Chief Shields resigned. She already said, hey, we're not going to chase people. So, okay, criminals know if I get to about 90 miles an hour, they're not going to chase me. I can just get away. Mm -hmm. And go to the next county. Right. I don't think that that's the right call. And then well, now you're saying we're not going to have officers abusing people. Abuse and a legal use of force is not the same thing. Again, mm -hmm. there is nobody that saw what happened to George Floyd that thought that was appropriate. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Not defense attorneys, not prosecutors, not detectives, not you know police officers, not rookies, not a Mary Kay salesman, not a Sunday school teacher, nobody. Mm -hmm. Everybody saw that and had the same reaction. Right. That's right. how we want to do things. Mm -hmm. Well, and so but in... Again, 
if you've got somebody that can fight two officers off of them and obtain a weapon from one of those officers, most people would logically say that might be a dangerous person sure. in that moment. Yeah. In that moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Milwaukee, we have uh, a uh, somewhat policy that not to chase um, because, but sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. It's very unclear. So we do get a lot of chases that do end up happening. And unfortunately, when they do happen, the person who they are um, trying to arrest and get them to slow down and stop and uh, they don't. And then they end up uh, in really bad crashes. And then those people end up actually killing somebody else um, right. through, with their vehicle. Um, and But then the issue is that there have been cases where they don't chase. And then the people who were able to escape that situation, they then that same day have committed other crimes. And right. either those officers then have uh, gotten into a police chase with them and the same thing happens or somebody else has died um, in the process of that second crime because that person was let go. Um, so making it an even more hostile situation down there doesn't seem like that is um, gonna help. Like by right, you know, making the you know air more tense if police officers don't feel safe um, in their own community then the civilians aren't going to feel safe and then other communities aren't feeling safe. So it's everything. I feel like that's why there's um, so much happening now in Atlanta. Well, and do you think it's going to cause a wave across the country? I mean, in a country that's, that's, you know, considering disbanding the police, defunding the police. Um, I mean, this is basically what they're asking for. Atlanta's police just said, well, all right, you, you don't want us. You don't want to allow us to do our jobs. Then, Okay, we're done. You know, we'll, we'll walk off. Well, you're you're on your own. Do you see this being, you know, something that causes a ripple effect across the country and other places, Stephen? Or, or Stephen, do you see that? Well, it, it can, but you also, I mean, a lot of times it has to do with the department. Just because they're doing this in Atlanta doesn't mean mm-hmm. that the police officers in Nashville are going to do it. Uh, sure. Now, but yet, if the same situation had happened in Nashville, yes, I would expect the blue flu to, to be. Uh, <laughs> To happen there as well, so I, I don't like really, <laughs> yeah, I don't really expect it to be a, you know, cause and effect type thing of what happened in Atlanta. There may be some here and there, but I, I really don't see that. But I, I will, I do see it if it happens in, in a lot of cities. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, I think what well, the bonus is that most most people aren't calling for you know disbanding and defunding it's reallocation and even more money in certain areas for more education and more training and and, it, and i think that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> so i think that that's the uh majority of people that's what they want to see and i hope that that is what happens and Cheryl, do you think do you think that the the police are? I mean, they haven't abandoned their city, right? They're they're not going to just leave the city in disarray. They're going to go through this and try to find some 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 middle ground here and come back. Yeah. Oh, there's no question about it. Let me tell you something. Mm-hmm. You don't get up every day and put that uniform on and that badge and remember that oath you took without fear or favor, and it not mean something to you every day. You're not going to do it. You're just trying to say what has happened today is not right. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way we will ever have a voice. And so when people are saying things like defund the police, it's almost laughable, really, because (laughs) those of us in criminal justice that Mm -hmm. sit in the police department every day, we know how many times DFAC and other social workers call us to go with them because they're too afraid. Mm -hmm. Sure. We know how many times. You know, somebody's got to knock on a door to either get, you know, a urine test out of somebody or they've got to pack their clothes because they've got a restraining order or the divorce isn't going well or their child won't go to school right. or brothers and sisters won't turn the music down. All of these things that could be handled by anybody else at the police is, is a police matter. Sure. So if you were to say, hey, we think there needs to be social workers that are called for people with mental illness, law enforcement would agree with you. If you said there needs to be programs for 
drug addiction and people that are homeless and people that are, you know, just wandering the streets with nowhere to go that, you know, have to find that next fix and have to find that next hit. We are all for that. Mm-hmm. The last thing we want to do, knowing that the temperature is going to be 104 or it's going to be below freezing, to know there's people sleeping outside. Right. But there's nothing we can do about it. The only thing we can do is if we show up, I mean, if we can figure out a way to take them to jail so they don't freeze to death, right. or if there's a shelter we can get them to. But again, we, in law enforcement, they have become the social workers. Yeah. So we're all for that. But the reality is, if you are going to take money away from a police department to give it to the social worker, that social worker is still going to need law enforcement to go with them. Right. Because, I, you know, when that first came up, the thing that I thought about was like, you know, answering a domestic violence call. They were talking about sending out a psychiatrist or a social worker. And I'm like, so what's going to happen? He, they're going to go knock on a door. This man is beating the heck out of his wife. And they're going to ask him. So how does that make you feel? Like, did something happen to you in your childhood that's making you do this? Like, how is that going to de-escalate? That's putting the social worker in in danger themselves, you know, because they don't go in there with equipped with with any type of, of force or, you know, they're not they're not carrying a gun. They're not you know, they're not doing anything like that. So how are they going to de-escalate or, or or make that come down? You know, I don't other than the fact that they're really good at talking. But I mean, You've already got a system, a social worker system that's completely overrun. And, you know, Colleen's husband is a social worker. He, he She knows about this, that they are overworked, underpaid. You know, they've got more cases than they could ever possibly keep up with. Um, so and, and but this this all boils down to, again, what we started with with Cheryl just a couple weeks ago. And Colleen, I'm going to go over Love Wins and then I'd love if you would talk about Christina's Gale Force. OK, well, um, so. So Love Wins, um, we came up with this with Cheryl um, a few weeks ago when we were talking about the the situation with, with, you know, how do we come to peace? You know, we've got people that on both sides who are inflamed and angry and tired. And, you know, we've got police officers that feel that they can't do their jobs. We've got, you know, people that feel that there's a systematic racism in the in the in the system. And that the only way that we're going to overcome this is by having some meaningful conversations, by sitting down and talking with one another, by listening to one another, and 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 by what Cheryl says is letting love win. You know, if that's in the end, that's what's going to happen. You have to have some understanding. So we began a campaign called Hashtag Love Wins with Cheryl and um, some of our friends. Stephen has gotten behind this and Joseph Scott Morgan is behind it as well in ushering in peace and setting up a scholarship fund um, where college age students can send in a 30 second video to goodwivesdish at gmail.com explaining how they lead with love and telling us a little bit about themselves and explaining their educational goals. And we are selling, you know, T-shirts, cups, magnets, stickers, all kinds of different things um, with our hashtag love wins on them. Um, and some of the, them have lead with love as well. So uh, and pro, a portion of the proceeds for those will go to the scholarship fund, as well as we've started a GoFundMe account where 100 percent of donations that we collect with that will go to a scholarship fund. We're hoping to raise about you know, at least $5,000. We'd like to raise that enough to give one student. If we raise more than that, we'll keep it going and we'll give out to more. And we're going to have a lot of these, if you guys start entering, we'll be, you know, playing them at the beginning of our broadcast here and on our podcast, The Good Wives Guide to True Crime. But I mean, Cheryl, this is, this was something that you came up with that love wins. So I wanted you to get a chance to talk a little bit about it too. Okay. Well, I mean, it's literally the way I live my life. It's literally the way I work as a crime scene investigator because I see it every day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like I told y'all last time, I'm not Pollyanna. I know the real world. I mean, I know swans don't swim in a sewer, like Nancy Grace told me a long time ago. <laughs> I get it. I know that. But here's what I also know. One man in Atlanta murdered three people. Mm-hmm. I contact the six who did something about it. Right. The Atlanta Police Department had no less than 20 people on mm-hmm. this day. Mm-hmm. I know love wins. Right. I know it. Right. Like you and I talked about 9-11. Mm-hmm. 
a handful of people mm-hmm. kill 3,000 people. Right. But that first day in New York City, mm-hmm. a million people showed up to give blood. Mm-hmm. You just think about that. From a handful of people to a million. I know I'm right. Dang it, Cheryl, you're making me cry. <laughs> but it's the blue, sugar. Yes. I mean, look at it. You know, you, you call 911 right now and say, my house is on fire. The police are coming. The fire department's coming. Your neighbors are going to jump in and help. An ambulance is coming. People that you don't know are going to start offering to do things for you. Mm-hmm. Every single time we have a child that goes missing, how many people search for that child that that child never met? Right. I mean, come on. It's the truth. Well, I grew up, I I mean, I grew up that way. I had a mother who had juvenile diabetes and I was a single child with a single mother. And I called from age six on, I I always knew how to dial the 911, you know, and the officers would come first and the ambulance would, you know, the fire department and the officers were like in a race to get there. And then the ambulance would generally get there, you know, and these are people who, came many times, you know, and I saw a handful of different people each time that all came in there to try try and make sure that I was okay, that my mother was okay, you know. They don't know me, they don't know my mom, but they handled it every single time with love and kindness and just trying to make sure that they could be there to help me, you know, and my mother, you know, I was a six year old kid. I can tell you right now as a nurse and, you know, I'm in that public uh, sector field just like Tim, just like you guys. And we're seeing evidence of it right now, even in the middle of a riot. Mm-hmm. There are people that stop to help each other and stop, you know, to make sure that a child is not afraid. Right. And you saw some wonderful things for police officers, and you saw some wonderful things for protesters. Mm-hmm. And that's the core of us. That's mm-hmm. the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's gonna, it's gonna be fine. Right. We're gonna be all. Well. Colleen has something that she wants to bring forward that our uh, we our co-host on Good Wives Guide to True Crime, Christina, um, she doesn't appear with us here on Murder by Design very often, um, but she is a force to be reckoned with within, within our team, and we just love her. And she wanted to come up with something that really, along with Love Wins campaign, was just, so, I think it's incredible, and we're working on it with you, Cheryl, and, and trying to get, you know, we're going to need some big backing behind this, but it is really, really important. So Colleen, you want to tell us about it? So along with our Love Wins campaign, we're also launching an organization that is tentatively called the Gale Force. The term Gale Force is used to describe a very strong, fierce wind, and the acronym Gale stands for Good Apples of Law Enforcement. Usually when we hear about any incident involving a wrongdoing by a member of the law enforcement, they're generally referred to as bad apples, which leaves people asking where are all the good apples. We all know that they exist, but we don't get to hear from them enough. And that's where the Gale Force comes into play. The Gale Force would be a safe process or in a safe space for those good apples to unify and take action against the bad apples. We believe that the good outnumber the bad in all aspects of life and that those numbers are where the Gale Force fierceness and strength comes from. When good unifies, bad always lose. There are issues in the law enforcement profession that need to be rectified, and we believe that this is the best way to resolve them starts from within. Um, There's what we call the blue wall of silence, which is where an informal rule where among police officers not to report on a colleague's misconduct or crimes, and it's time to tear that wall down. Officers are often punished if they break that wall of silence. An example of this is when Officer Carol Horn, who we have been hearing about recently, Back in 2006, she stopped another officer from putting a suspect in a chokehold, and she was fired after 19 years on the job and lost her pension because she intervened. Also, the stigma that goes along with members of law enforcement seeking out mental health care needs to end. The studies have shown that members of law enforcement are less willing to seek care because of embarrassment and shame. Keep in mind that this is a high-stress profession with a high number of suicide than other professions. There have also been studies that indicate that if an officer receives support from their unit, they are much more likely to seek help when it's needed. We believe that the good members of the law enforcement far outweigh the bad. We also believe that the system may need to change and to give them a louder voice without fear of retribution or desertion by their colleagues or superiors. We hope the Gale Force can be the first step in giving these law enforcement officers from all across the country support and a way to come together and say, we will not stand by and allow anyone to tarnish the profession that we have dedicated ourselves to 
and we're gonna clean up the barrel one bad apple at a time. Oh, so that's something, you know, that we're all working on that we're hoping that we'll, you know, change, change this climate, change what is going, what we're seeing right now in a world that we are dealing with absolute hate right now and, and inflammation of emotions on all sides. You know, I think that this is such an important thing that we are working on and we're hoping that we'll be able to, you know, usher in some change and some, some peace and harmony and, and, you know, different things to help. And I'm, I'm really hoping, you know, that we get some good, um, good help with this, you know, and I think uh, it'll help bring in some good feelings for people to have faith and trust in their lo local law enforcement and law enforcement overall, um, just so that they feel more connected to the force and that they know that there are those good apples out there and right. that they are more than the bad. And so I think right. this would help bridge, you know, the very raw exterior barrier um, between the uh, opposing sides right now. Yeah. So I know we've been promising for a little <laughs> while, and this is going to be a little bit of a pivot here from the heaviness that we have been dealing with. We're going to talk just a teeny tiny bit about the craziness of Tiger King and how Stephen David Lampley and Cheryl Mack McCollum have been helping with the Don Lewis disappearance. So you guys got together, you were called in to do some cold case look at this. So tell us both, you know, tell us guys a little bit about what you what you found, where you're at with it how it's going um you know how you got started again because we, we had you on a while back to talk about it but i hear there's been some big updates on it go ahead cheryl you want me to start or Steve? yes yeah one? yeah he, she, he says you cheryl he says you <laughs> you're it tag you're it <laughs> um, i was on nancy Grace with sheriff conister Mm -hmm. And afterwards, we talked, and he asked for our help. And I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, we started looking at it, and the first thing we do is what we call an Orbit 360. And it's just literally a real quick trip around this case, and we touch on the big items first. Like, what can we do immediately to kind of focus them where they need to be going? So we did that first, and we had folks. I mean, obviously, Stephen was, you know, a pivotal part. We also had Dr. Lillian Glass, mm -hmm. who did body language. Mm -hmm. So she watched the entire series and did a report just on, you know, the body language of Carol Baskin. Oh, we need to talk with her. We got to talk with her. <laughs> Let me tell you, she is, she is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, it helped us also on Natalie Wood, mm -hmm. where she did the body language. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you just have to listen to her, and, and I will I will hook y'all up because she's she's mm -hmm. phenomenal. And oh, we love her. Smart and fun and classy. Mm -hmm. She's just remarkable. But you know, we had folks like Christine Menina again, and Dr. Petler, and Dr. Petler talked about staging, and she talked about different things that they needed to look for, mm -hmm. and gave like her triad of, of things and. Uh, Peter Hyatt, the statement analyst, Love him. the 10th letter that Carol Baskins wrote to Don's first wife, and he analyzed the whole thing word for word, sentence by sentence, mm -hmm. paragraph by paragraph, um, and it was pretty eye-opening. And then, you know, we had, you know, other folks that, from just a podcast standpoint, whether it's Web Flues or Levi Page, people like that, that are going to come mm -hmm. in and say, this is the kind of thing you need to be looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what we can do to get the word out, you know, because maybe somebody knew Don, maybe somebody seen Don that doesn't even know y'all looking for him, you know. So we had people that had expertise in real estate and mm -hmm. forensic accounting. Um, you know, we gave them the best, you know, idea that we had, whether it was, the, you know, IRS or somebody else that needed to come in. But there's a group on the internet that I also told the sheriff about that is doing remarkable things. Mm -hmm. And there's a large number of them. So, again, you, you can't discount them right. because they don't have a batch. Anybody mm -hmm. can solve a cold case, and I've said that my entire career. Mm -hmm. Zodiac, it was an English teacher, I think, sitting at his kitchen table that cracked the first code, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. The truck driver found the DC sniper. I mean, don't count people out. Mm -hmm. You know, they can help you if you'll let them. And these folks are way ahead. 
then you know what you know five people can do or what yeah, I think I, I think I think Colleen and I are and Christina are all in that group of people that are looking into that right now. Uh, there, it's it's like we're you know it's 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 not 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 similar to it, it's very as I'm saying it's it's very similar to you know the Netflix series uh, don't don't have cats you know okay. and and the same situation yeah but I've been in that group for a while and I'm I'm I mean it's 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 crazy but well, Stephen. Go ahead. I'm somebody I've talked to quite a bit mm -hmm. and knows me. I've talked to quite a bit, and I've been very publicly, you know, bragging and, and mm -hmm. telling people, don't sleep on them. Because I even said, uh, Oh, Nancy Grace, mm -hmm. I said, There's a show called Don't F with Cat. Mm -hmm. And I said, Well, that should be Don't F with Bigger Cat. Right. <laughs> I would watch it. The world would watch it. It was extraordinary. Yeah. And I love, you know, what all that entire group was mm -hmm. able to do. Well, mm -hmm. group was, I mean, my God. I mean, I, I told him for the first time I talked to him, and I said, you know, we just started because he just asked us. Mm -hmm. And I, we can't catch up. Right. I mean, you've got 2,000 people that have already pulled records from this date to that date, and they've already cross-checked this and that, mm -hmm. and they've already, you know, mm -hmm. gotten mm -hmm. this person and that person involved. So, I mean, I've talked to, you know, one of his daughters, I've talked to the ex-secretary, I've talked to uh, the guy that, you know, you did his flight. I've, I mean, I've talked to some of the people, but again, Rip has already done that. There's already video. So, I told the corporal, I said, he has saved you all kind of time if you'll just utilize them. And I know that sometimes there's a pushback that if you're in law enforcement, you don't want to use a civilian for anything. But that may not always be the right call, especially if they're doing phenomenal work. You at mm -hmm. least should sit down and say, okay, what do you got for me? Right, and right. And thank them profusely. <laughs> And so, so where are we at with this? I mean, I know that we've, we've, because we spoke with Thomas Fastrick ourselves, um, a, a handwriting expert who has, you know, informed us that the, the, the power of attorney and the will were both definitely a tracing. Uh, we've also spoke with Joseph Fritz, who was longtime friend attorney, who said, you know, oh God, this smells so bad, you know. So where where are you guys at? What have you been able to accomplish uh, that you can talk about? I know that there's lots of things you probably can't talk about, but what what juicy little details can you give us? Oh, there's Stephen again. Awesome, we lost. Oh, I'll pick straight up. I mean, there's some federal people you can bring in. Uh huh. The IRS and the people that oversee the Internal Revenue Mm -hmm. You know, these animals and zoos, that's, that's another group. Right. And, you know, are the animals being fed properly? And is everything up to par with mm -hmm. the rental property? And mm -hmm. what was going with the wheel versus the restraining order versus the power of attorney versus this land transaction and everything else? Mm -hmm. What we gave him was an action plan. These are the people that need to be re interviewed. Mm -hmm. These people that you need to cross check what they said then, what they said on the show and what they're saying to you now. Right. And it's gonna take some time. It's not fast. Yeah. Right. And what people have to remember, what you believe and what you can prove is not the same thing. Totally two different things. Right. And, and so, you don't want to screw up right like, mm -hmm. anything out of order. Well you so get you one shot, to, you know, you yeah. get you get one shot and you lose your shot then that's it. Now, Stephen, what part did you play in this? What did you end up helping and, and looking at and doing with this? Well, I was looking at the interviews they did with, with Baskins and trying to determine any inconsistencies or lying or deception. Uh, right, because you do ca how doing. to catch a liar, right? right. So yeah. mm -hmm. I, I reviewed some of the interviews on her and uh, without going into any detail or, or giving away anything, uh, I did find some stuff that concerned me, and I submitted that information to to them to the show. Uh, so, uh, so you did find you did find some deceptions that you. Were, I found you were I found something here. that was interesting. I'll leave it at that. I found some interesting tidbits. So, uh, ooh, yeah, because um, you know, I've been taking some of your classes over at Oliphant Institute, and you mentioned earlier about you know uh, unorganized and organized serial killers. Mm -hmm. um, you go into that in your serial killer profiling. Um, 
101 and 102. Mm -hmm. um, you've got how to catch a liar that that is, you know, really amazing. I loved that that course. Uh, just so good. Um, and so, you know, you've been doing a lot of that, but that, that, I mean, that's, so that's deception is, is, is a big thing in this. I, I watched today, I think it was a, another podcast. Um, oh gosh, I, it's the behavioral panel.com. I think it is. And they did like an hour long and they're all different experts in different parts of deception, body language, handwriting. And they did a whole thing on Carol Baskins and, mm -hmm. and analyzing her, the way she says things, how the patterns of speech that she, and I was fascinated. I mean, absolutely mm -hmm. fascinated. There's definitely no question in my mind that she is extremely, extremely deceptive. Um, and you know, here's the great thing. If you've got Dr. Lillian Glass mm -hmm. with Stephen David Lansley, mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with Dr. Dwayne Thompson, and they're using four different techniques to tell you when and where she's deceptive, then that's mm -hmm. money. Right. Yep. Money. Right. Right. And, and we have that in our action plan. We have it. Well, I am so impressed, you know, and thank you guys so much. We, I know it took a lot of your time to not, we've asked Stephen, you know, to do a 15 minute spot with us once a month. And here we are, we we're an hour long again. You know, we always end up going way longer than we are. Um, these are people you're going to keep seeing over and over on our show. We're very thankful that they sit down and take the time to do this with us, guys. Uh, you know, if you have questions for them ever, you can always send it in to us at truecrimewives at gmail.com. You can send questions and comments there. We can always bring them on, ask them some things, you know. So if you've got anything for them. But, guys, I want to thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Um, and, and just and just being here and supporting this community in, in in informing them about what's going on, you know, because I think that's one of the biggest things that's going to help change things is making sure that people know what is happening, you know, and what they're seeing and why things are the way they are. You know, we talked about the fact that there wasn't a rush to arrest in the Floyd case. And now we're seeing the opposite in this case with the, with Rolf, you know, and, and how different those two things are. And I'm that that's fascinating to me because, you know, in, in a con time when people are the instant gratification for everything, people need to understand why things happen the way they do, you know, that it's not just a, a lark that, Oh, we took, you know, four extra days. And so people should be like, they're not going to do anything. No, they're doing something, you know, uh, you take the time to do it right. The first time. Right. Right. So thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it. If you got any other juicy details about Tiger King or anything else, you know, y'all can always hit us up. So, um, but thanks again for being here tonight. Um, and I'll close it out with, again, remember that in all of this, in everything that we're facing right now, hashtag love is going to win. So hashtag love wins. Hashtag love wins. So thank you so much, guys. Um, I appreciate y'all so, so, so very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. You're welcome, honey. Wow. What a great show, guys. I can't even believe so that we were able to have that. Ha you know, that was so much great information. So much great information, you know. Yeah, they're we love them so much. We love all of the people who come on our show. They mm -hmm. just truly, truly are some of the best people in their field. And mm -hmm. they give us the time of day and to tell us what they're doing and everything. Mm -hmm. um, and not just what they personally are doing, but what should be happening and what shouldn't be happening. And um, mm -hmm. they are very, very knowledgeable people with big hearts. And um, right. you'll see them yeah, again. We, and, you're going to see them again and again and again and again. <laughs> you might get sick of them. <laughs> not um, okay. So just, just let you guys know, normally, you know, we do a normal, um, just a broadcast where we, we, have a prior recorded something that comes up on Friday nights. We, and we put it out here and we usually do a live chat tonight. We chose to do this live. We're going to do more of these live broadcasts with uh, guests and, and discussions and things like that. Um, but I did want to let you know that along with what Cheryl and Steven shared tonight with, about Tiger King, we will be releasing tomorrow afternoon um, the interviews that we did with Thomas Bastrick, the handwriting expert, which was super, super, super informative. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot 
lot of times we deal when we're talking this stuff with with Cheryl and and Stephen and and even Joseph Scott Morgan. We deal a lot in theory. He is extremely no balls fact. This is that. This is what I can see. I can see it. It's this. It's that. And that's all he's going to tell you. He's not going to speculate. He's not going to guess nope. about it. He's, he's got fact. absolute <laughs> facts. Um, so we've got him tomorrow, and we've also got Joseph. Um, uh, Joseph R. Fritz, which was a longtime friend of both Carol and and uh, Don Lewis, and he mm -hmm. gives us some information about the background of those two, and what and he talks about what he actually thinks happened. Um, mm -hmm. Now it's just a theory; it's what he thinks. But um, I would think that somebody that was as close to the the them as as he was would have maybe some good ideas on what really happened and uh, he's yeah a lawyer he's ago. still a lawyer guys he's, he's still a lawyer he's in he's 70s. in his i think he's in his in his 70s or, or even 80s maybe but he is a lawyer and he is just plugging away guys and he's so funny he has such great character and in in interesting interesting character let me tell you so you guys are not going to want to miss those tomorrow afternoon um i should have them up probably you know mid to late afternoon four or five o'clock come over on the channel look for them um now remember guys we just hit our thousand uh subscribers which we were so excited about but we are still having our contest so if you want to enter to win a either love wins or a uh good wives guide to true crime uh t-shirt you can do so by sharing about the channel and tagging us on any of the in, of the social media so instagram twitter any of them we're collecting names and mid-july we're going to draw have a drawing for that and get you guys that out now another thing that is just just coming out we just we just released our new brand new website guys so um that's mad ginger entertainment.com it's going to tell you about all of our projects that we have going on besides you know the podcast and this youtube channel um it allows you to besides the patreon now you can still do our patreon um and support the podcast and get some inside details and stuff but it allows you to do a yearly subscription which shaves you just a little bit of money um and you get some cool stuff in that so you guys are able to go over and check that out um, um, but it's we, we are moving and shaking. We're doing a lot of good things right now. Uh, we are wrapping up our second season over on uh, the Good Wives Guide to True Crime. Uh, we'll probably be finishing that up late August. We're going to take a short break and bam, then we'll be back in season three with some crazy, crazy stuff. We're going to start with Bundy. Um, we've talked with Kevin Sullivan, who has written numerous books on uh, you know, on Bundy, we've also got one of the survivors that we've been talking with and, and are working on a project with her. And we're all She's very, amazing. very excited about. She's uh, an amazing person. Her soul so is as bright as bright can be. I've just the 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 warmth and strength that comes off of that woman is incredible. Um, and so and, and don't forget, we do have our head to head on Scott Peterson coming up. Um, I do think that we have a couple people. We talked with Kirk Nurmi last night about Scott Peterson. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a little bit about it with a couple of our other friends too. So you're going to be wanting to come back and see all that. Uh, but we've just got so much going on. And then if that is not enough, when we take our break for season two from the Good Wives Guide to True Crime, we are starting a brand new podcast and we are doing that with Todd Matthews from former director of NAMIS, and it's going to be all about missing person cases. So if you have a missing person case that you either just are involved with in some way, or you just want to know about it, make sure you send those in to us at truecrimewives at gmail.com so that we can review them and, and get him looking at them. Um, because I mean, he's just amazing, amazing, amazing. And we can't wait to launch that podcast. Um, so there's a lot going on over here. Yeah, it's a lot of it. <laughs> and I just got a mouth of and, on, on to that. Well, I mean, it's pretty much all of it. We just, we talk with so many experts from so many different fields. Um, and we're hoping we can get them all to talk about a panel. Um, oh, yes. The Gypsy all. Rose, the Gypsy Rose panel. Yes. Um, so because, you know, we talk with Cheryl McCollum, we talk with Joseph Scott Morgan, mm -hmm. we, um, mm -hmm. we talk with everybody and we're going to, you know, round it or just go in deep on Gypsy with all of our people at mm -hmm. one time to talk about their expertise and that case. Um, and so mm -hmm. we're super, super excited for it. Um, 
it i am so excited with what we're doing and we're growing guys you definitely want to get in now while you can because mm -hmm. there's some big stuff happening so thank you so much for tuning in and dishing true crime with good wives and murder by design. Um, you can always check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and uh, Facebook at true crime wives. Um, so any of those with, you know, facebook.com slash true crime wives, Twitter slash true crime wives. So you can check us out there and uh, make sure that you sign up for either our new yearly membership or our Patreon club at patreon.com slash true crime wives. You get lots of inside documents, information. What else do they get, Colleen? Um, they get bonus episodes of uh, from different perspectives, including myself. I do a historical episode once a month. Uh, where I talk about more historical cases and maybe a little bit gruesome cases that are not YouTube friendly. <laughs> and we're also, um, you know, we're working on a lot of different things over there, guys. Um, I just lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. I had something <laughs> I wanted to finish it up with. Oh, the historical stuff. You know, Colleen did a wonderful piece on um, JFK and we talked with um, Jack O'Halloran. Um, who had some very interesting information. If you guys don't know who Jack O'Halloran is, um, he was the uh, the bad guy in the original Supermans, you know. So um, we did a podcast with him uh, a while back. We talked with him. Colleen did a follow-up inside the Patreon. Um, oh, I know what it was. That made me rem remember. So we're going to be seeing us over on Facebook and Instagram doing some morning, mid-morning updates um, here and there. So we're working on that as well of trying to do some you know quick five ten minute little things for you guys to kind of get some current event news um quickly and then we'll do our follow-ups here so we're going to be going a little more structured here from now on we're going to do one night um friday nights we're going to try and dedicate to more current events that are happening so when you're talking we're talking about Lori vallow you know leticia stout all the other things that are coming up and and hitting right now and then sundays are going to be more of a um series you know mm -hmm. we're going to do several several things um one of them we're starting off with is um um, Alyssa Turney's case. Uh, we had a wonderful time of sitting down with her, her sister and talking about her case. Uh, we also uh, sat down with Jax Miller, who wrote um, Hell in the Heartland and pro helped produce that series. Wonderful and, series. And so that's that's one of one of Colleen's favorite cases. You know uh, that and about, Children of the Snow with uh, Children of the Snow. Jay Rubin Applebaum. Jay Rubin Appleman. 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 I always say I know. Appleman too. I know. But guys, so thank you so much for tuning in and, and hanging out with us tonight. I know this was a long one and we gave you a lot to think on. Um, but, you know, that's what we do. We try to give you guys information because, you know, um, we like to serve up true crime one dish at a time. Bye. Bye. I have to actually end the broadcast. <laughs>